Hi, I'm Rhonda. I'm Angie. And we are Adventures in Nomadness. Hey, we have been dry camping in our 21C in winter conditions, so we want to share that with you and how cold it got. All right, so as many of you know, we came up to Alaska during the summer and then we decided to stay the winter. And because of a delay with our wood stove in the cabin, we ended up living, uh, continuing to live in our beloved 21C for longer than we had anticipated. So how cold did it get? Pretty darn cold. <laughs> so the co very coldest we outside temperature that we've actually lived in the 21C was minus 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Pretty cold. And so we've learned a lot about winter camping and we definitely want to share that all with you. So thanks to all of you that asked your very specific questions. We're going to incorporate our, uh, what we've learned and all of your questions into this video. So before we get started, how about you tell us exactly how long we've been dry camping in this Escape RV? Yeah, it's kind of a good information. So we have dry camped in here continuously since March. So that's a combination of uh, boondocking, dry camping, mooch docking, uh, but on our own property we have dry camped now since uh, the very end of May. So June, July, August, September, October, November, Ooh, about six months on our own property. Awesome. I've got more questions. Okay. Just a minute. I got to run off to another location to ask those questions. Alrighty then. Can't wait. Oh. <laughs> what did you use to power your 21C while you were dry camping? How did th those things change over time? And what additional items did you use to supplement your power needs? All right, well, first I want to share what our system is. Uh, but before that, I actually want to share what the outside temperature right now as we speak. It's actually minus 15. And we're in the cabin now, but we've kept the heat on in here so we could do this video. And I've uh, turned it up to about 55, and it's actually quite comfortable in here right now. Um, this is definitely the temperature that we wouldn't want to stay in here. It's just kind of so drafty around the dinette. But uh, what is our system? I mean, what is the, the tools and the system we have on board that have helped us get to this point. So we've got 270 watt solar panels on the roof. We have an additional 100 watt solar suitcase. We have a 2200 watt uh, Honda generator that has been completely sufficient for our needs in the RV as well as the cabin. Uh, we do have also uh, a uh, rock pals. This is a portable power station. Um, this is our old 300 watt. We've actually upgraded to a 500 watt. And I'll actually talk about this a little bit later and why this has been so useful for us. Oh, and uh, we do have the spray foam insulation and the tank heaters. And I think that is everything as far as our system. Uh, we also have two six volt AGM batteries. So how have our needs changed over time since we've been to Alaska? Um, so we got here at the end of May. We've relied 100% on our rooftop solar for pretty much all summer. Uh, no issues there whatsoever. Temperatures were, you know, typical summer temperatures with, uh, you know, some rain and stuff. But yeah, we've relied 100% on our rooftop solar for quite a while. And then um, August, the sun starts dipping. The days start getting a little shorter and temps start getting uh, colder. So it's starting to get in the 40s at night. So it was until August that we started relying more on our solar suitcase. We were able to move that around and tilt that so uh, we could catch the sun as it was coming around. So that, that actually helped a lot too. It really wasn't until September that we started using the generator on a regular basis. 
So we get into September, uh, the temperatures start dipping into the 30s at night, um, you know, low 30s, high 20s, and then during the day it was warming up to 40s, occasionally low 50s, but it was pretty much a high of 40s. Uh, during that time. So it really wasn't until October where things started to get very interesting and more like winter conditions. Um, so back in September we did start using the generator a little bit, probably about once a day just to supplement the fact that the days were getting a lot shorter in September and we weren't getting a lot of sun at that point. So uh, October that's when things really started to get cold uh, down into the 20s at night, 30s during the day, and using the generator more often, about twice a day for maybe an hour, uh, twice a day just to juice up the batteries there. And then um, by mid-October is when it was predicted that the temperatures were going to dip into the teens for an extended period of time. So it was at that point we decided to winterize the RV and we continued to live in the RV for about five weeks after winterization. So um, at that point um, after winterization and because the days are much shorter and it's much colder and the furnace is running a lot more, we're obviously having a harder time keeping the, the batteries charged up. So at that point we were using the generator um, still a couple times a day but for a longer duration, probably two to three hours each time morning and in the evening. And that's the progression of how we've used our system uh, to keep everything running smooth in the RV as the temperatures have gotten colder and colder. And then um, by the time we moved out temperatures, uh, the coldest temps we had were down to minus 10 and at that point everything's running, uh, the furnace is running pretty continuously and we're using the generator quite a bit at that point. It's nine degrees this morning and uh, our battery power is down to 51 percent so I gotta go get the generator. We have it in the cabin, we haven't moved in yet and uh, uh, I gotta keep it warm overnight so it's in the cabin and I'm gonna take it over and uh, put it on the, the RV, the trailer, so that we can get some battery power. I would say right now that's kind of our biggest challenge. It's not so much the cold, it's the, uh, it's the battery, keeping the battery charged up. So basically, you know, we went to bed with probably about 75% uh, percent, and just with the heater running constantly at these temperatures, it's brought it down to uh, 51% percent, um, when it came over here. So anyway, let's go get the generator. So we originally bought the Honda 2200 to run all the power tools we have for working on the cabin. And of course now we're glad we have it because we're using it so much for the RV batteries, keeping them charged up. So I don't know what we'd do without this at this point. Why a Honda 2200? Uh, I've had a Honda generator before and I know uh, how great a quality they are. I've had friends buy some other similar generator inverter types that uh, failed <laughs> within a short period of time. So they bought them because they cost a lot less. Hondas are definitely more money, but uh, I think their, their quality, their longevity is a lot better. The tank of gas, just I think over a gallon or so, usually lasts us about a day. Sometimes slightly less depending on how many tools I'm running. You notice I have this on a sled. It makes it really easy to bring back and forth. This weighs like 40 pounds or so. We have a little table here. We had the generator under when uh, it was snowing and raining. Um, it's really clear right now, so we don't need it. But I also have the exhaust pointing that way. We have the exhaust pointing oh, I had it under the table there, with the exhaust pointing towards the trailer. And <laughs> as we've done before, not no problem. Uh, but with the still air, or for whatever reason, the window wasn't cracked or, or anything, the exhaust actually was going inside and our CO2 alarm went off. So just be kind of careful as uh, where you point the exhaust. So our CO2 <laughs> alarm works great, we found out. Yay! And there we have it. Juice. Right on. Now I can run the microwave if I want. That's another thing we do when we do have the generator hooked up. We try to, to maximize the use. Not just recharging the battery, but 
at this point, you know, we can't run the microwave without it being on the generator. If we want to use a toaster, now's the time to use a toaster, uh, charge up everything that we have. Um, sometimes we'll, we'll still use the electric uh, space heater and plug that in too so that we're reducing our uh, amount of propane because we're going through propane like crazy obviously in these temperatures. Oh and another question, when did you decide to winterize and how did you live in your RV including after you did. All right, so we uh, ran all of our plumbing systems, no problems at all, into the upper 20, 20s. And then when it was predicted to get down to the teens for a while, we're like, oh, we better winterize because we don't want to have to deal with, with uh, freezing anything, which we had to anyway. But anyway, um, originally we were getting our water in the back of a truck. So we have a 30 gallon tank in the back of the truck. We'd run up to the gas station where they had a water fill there for RVs and stuff. And so we'd bring it back and then fill the RV. Great. Everything ran great. We had plenty of solar. And uh, then of course, when they shut off the water, when it got too cold, then uh, we went to five gallon buckets, uh, five gallon jugs basically for getting our water. Now we're super lucky because I've lived here for so long and I've got lots of friends that I can say, hey, can I come and buy and get some water? And so we've got a bunch of probably five or six, five gallon, six, five gallon buckets, jugs, and we just go and fill those up. So once we winterized, we still lived in here for about five weeks and you still have to have systems to live with. And one of the things we actually love the most is this uh, USB rechargeable pump. So it just fits on the top of these jugs and we got water, pretty sweet. We also, for our gray, are just using this collapsible container here. And then um, what we do, because we have to worry about critters, especially in the summer, is uh, or just in general, even in the spring, when everything starts to melt, we are really careful with our waste. So uh, all dishes, we wipe everything off and it goes in the garbage. And then when we do dishes, they're pretty cleaned off anyway. And then we can just dump the dish water or whatever water goes in here out in the woods. Um, or into the outhouse hole, which we didn't have an outhouse for a while. So this is how we used our, our got our water and did our gray after winterizing. All right, so our gray and black before we were able to uh, dump at a campground around here. If we went somewhere, we just uh, would dump it at a, a site we could. Uh, so after winterizing, getting the gray, but uh, so many people want to know about the black and a lot of people want to know where well, your black tank is under the bed. You should be able to use that. And uh, we thought we might be able to get away with using our black tank for a little bit longer. Um, but it was an epic, epic fail of epic proportions. No, you cannot use your black tank. <laughs> and here's why. Hopefully you'll learn from our epic mistake. So we winterized, we stopped using the fresh and the gray, and we kept using the, the black. However, we don't put solid waste into our black tank. So just number one, this is too much information, I'm sure, but just number one is going into our black tank. Okay, now that we've established that. We decided for, uh, you know, just being in here that we wanted to still be able to use the, the bathroom because, hey, the black tank's inside. And uh, we did that for a while. So we had committed to taking a friend to the airport on Halloween, October 31st. And we thought, okay, we'll, we'll go ahead and dump the, the tank then and just dump it into the buckets and take that up to the outhouse to dump. And um, I had actually put some RV antifreeze down it just so it would get into the kind of the dump valve area and went to go dump it. Well, duh, of course it's frozen. It was down in the teens. So yeah, we could not dump our black tank and it was probably a good half maybe to at least half full, at least half full. Um, and yeah, couldn't dump it. And we had to go to the airport and we were going to go to Anchorage for a couple days. We're like, oh no, what are we going to do? And so I am literally out there with a hairdryer and it was 15 degrees. And this is the only reason I have a hairdryer. I rarely, rarely ever use a hairdryer on my hair, but it is one of the best emergency tools out there, especially for winter living. So I might want to put a hairdryer in your toolkit because they do come in handy 
for winter camping. So I'm out there at 15 degrees. We're supposed to take a friend to the airport really soon. And I'm out there with my bunny boots sitting on the ground on some foam, trying to keep my butt warm, the hair dryer on the dump valve because it is frozen solid. Matter of fact, it's all nice and pink right there at the dump valve. I'm like, ah. Oh. And uh, it started to thaw out a little bit. If I'd kept at it, I might have gotten it, but it was so cold and my toes were freezing and my hands were freezing. We had to take our friend to the airport and we we're getting all stressed out at this point. So I had to quit using the hairdryer. At that point, Rhonda and I are in here with a pump and a couple hoses. And Rhonda's up here holding the pump that we have a 12 volt socket going into. And she's holding the pump right here. I'm in the bathroom and we've got, we got this strung around. We have a bucket and we're actually trying to suck the liquid matter out of our black tank from the toilet end. And I don't know, we probably got three buckets or so out of it. Not ideal in any stretch of the imagination. <sighs> All right, well, we got as much out as we could, knowing there was still probably plenty in there and we just had to go we gotta go gotta take our friend to the airport that we've already promised that we're going to do that and so we're like we couldn't keep the heat on in here and so we just had to mindset that it's gonna freeze we're gonna have a solid tank of solid tank anyway we did go down to anchorage came back after a couple days and of course it was probably some of the coldest temperatures we've had so we have a solid ice block in our black tank and uh, waited for um, the next warm day, which was like high 20s, which is kind of warm this time of year. It might have been low 30s. And at that point, we ran heaters. We had the bed open. We're running heaters in there, space heaters, had a generator going, just trying to warm up everything as, as uh, much as possible. And at that point, woo success and got it to thaw out and we're all good now. Fortunately, no damage was done whatsoever. So our black tank didn't crack. The uh, conduit coming down, the ABS pipe uh, coming down from that to the dump valve didn't break, nothing cracked. Uh, the dump valve, I don't think is cracked, but I guess I'll find out more in the spring when we start using the tanks again. And uh, note to self that in the winter, everything is very, very cold and things break very easily so the cap for the dump valve I broke off the little flanges because I couldn't get that off and uh, yeah anyway I had a happy ending but it was not a pretty thing to get to that happy ending <laughs> so if you ever feel like you want to use your your tanks your black tank uh, just kind of keep in mind the temperatures that you might be uh, using it and uh, you may very well want to insulate your dump valve if you're going to be in, in really cold temperatures for any length of time Okay, so after that debacle, what we were using for the bathroom? Well, we were still working on the outhouse up there. We didn't quite have it have it finished yet. So we have a like a portable camp toilet. Works great. We actually put that in there. Pretty awkward to use, but again, it's probably too much information, but it gives you an idea of how you might want to be able to, uh, you know, still use a bathroom after winterizing. And that actually worked really good. There's uh, Legable Loos. There's you know all kinds of other things you can use. Uh, what we've done in the past too, we used to have a teardrop camper and those do not have a bathroom. So we bought a pop-up tent, it was super easy to pick to uh, put up uh, with a portable toilet in that. And uh, that, that worked great. So that's another option. You could put out a, like your own outhouse basically with a, a shower tent. Uh, outhouse tent and uh, put your own toilet in there. I'm going to put a link to one of Bob Wells videos. <laughs> he did a great video on uh, pooping while camping and so I'm not going to talk about that subject because he did it very well. I'm going to put a link to that. How did you stay warm? What kind of heating you did you use in your RV? Was it a giant tank like this? And how did those needs change over time? No, we did not use a ginormous propane tank like we have on the back of the cabin. Uh, we have the two five gallon tanks that came with the RV on the front that we're using for propane. And then we bought two additional tanks. So we have four five gallon propane tanks, which was great. So running through propane because we are primarily using the furnace. 
and at temps um, 20s, low 30s, high teens, I'm probably going through propane maybe every three to five days depending on uh, our usage, how we had the, the temperature set. One of the big questions was what did we have the temperature set at? And we had it typically set at around uh, 68 like when we're just sitting around here and about 60 overnight and because we have cute little dogs you know we have to keep it warm in here during the day when we're over in the cabin working so we kept it right around 64 or so. Um, our secondary temp um, minder monitor that we had uh, did, did show a difference in temperature from what the thermostat showed so I think it was probably some place in the middle so even if we had it uh, set at 60 overnight. As many of you know, the complaint is that there's a, a pretty large temperature fluctuation. So if you have it set at 60 overnight, it's probably going to dip to like 52 or so before it kicks back on again, roughly. And so there is that uh, temperature fluctuation there. Uh, for the most part, our, we were actually warm in here the whole time. It wasn't until I got to uh, below, like well below you know zero that it gets really really cold and drafty um, any any place by the walls basically all right one way we kind of helped our, our propane sometimes last a little longer is when we're running the generator is to also run a, a small uh, electric space heater so if you're uh, if you actually have power this is a really great way to go because it keeps the heat a little bit more even in here um, Another question is, uh, does propane freeze? Well, it doesn't actually freeze freeze until it gets to like minus 300 degrees. So not a temperature any of us are ever gonna face outside a lab. But the downside to propane in extremely cold temperatures is it doesn't have the same amount of pressure to flow. So when it got down to uh, below zero, like really zero and less, maybe five degrees to minus 10, uh, we did start having issues with propane. I would put a new bottle on and test it to make sure everything was good there. And then um, like literally the next day, it was showing red on the indicator. I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe we're going through propane that fast. Well, and I take the bottle off, I'm like, it still feels like there's a lot in here. So basically there wasn't enough pressure to, um, to keep that indicator showing that there was green and still propane in the bottle. So that is one downside. We also noticed it on the stove, the flame just didn't seem as, as full and it took longer to boil anything. So really low temperatures, propane definitely has a bit more of an issue as far as how that's, that's gonna run. So I do have a couple of ways of making sure that your propane does not go off at two o'clock in the morning. All right, so one thing we found is taking the cover on and off is kind of a pain because we've been going through propane so fast. So again, we're going through propane uh, depending on the temperature every three to five days, roughly. And so we just got something, you can use anything, but we had leftover foam board from the cabin. So we've just been keeping that over top of everything uh, that prevents the snow and ice from accumulating on top of the regulator and on top of the tanks. So one thing I like to do, because nobody likes the 2 a.m. when your furnace goes out because you're out of propane, nobody wants that to happen. So what I do when I'm changing tanks out is I will switch switch the lever over. So take that one off. Put this one on. Because every once in a while, me or Rhonda, doesn't matter. We'll not get this tight enough or seated correctly. And so I'll turn the bottle on. I've got the selector lever on the, so I'm looking at it this side, right hand side. So I'm gonna switch it over to this side. And then what I usually do is walk away for a few minutes and uh, come back and make sure that it's not on red. So a few times I have, a couple times I'll come back and and it was on red. I'm like, ah, oh, I'm glad I checked it. So like I said, we didn't have that 2 a.m. freezing when it's zero degrees outside. So, so far so good on that one. And then, um, you know, come back after walking away and switch it back on the tank that's that's uh, been, been on there for a little bit. And that looks pretty good. So I'm gonna switch that back. And then that way we're all good. One of the other things you can do is make sure you clean your sail switch periodically 
Uh, what we discovered that if we use the furnace intermittently, like every once in a while, we actually have more problems with uh, fuzz and stuff on the sail switch. The more we use the furnace, the less issues we have. But I have done a couple of preemptive uh, cleanings of the sail switch and found tons of fuzz and lint on it that in previous instances has completely just shut down the furnace. So it, there's no rhyme or reason on, on what's going to uh, cause your sail switch to fail and what's not. So um, I'd say if you're going to be using your RV a lot in the winter time is to clean your sail switch every couple of weeks. I think that's really saved our bacon. All right, so what are some alternatives to running your propane furnace? Well, again, if you have power, you know, hook up or, or a generator, hook up a, an electric. Um, obviously on a generator, it's going to run through a lot of gas. But uh, if you have hookups at a campground, you can use a, an electric space heater for that. Some people will use a Mr. Buddy, but I definitely want to caution in how you use these. We have this set up uh, for other uses for our shed with a filter on it that we can use with a five gallon uh, tank. Normally these are designed for the, the one pound bottles and those are running here. Uh, some people do go that way, that way overnight. Um, they'll last depending on if you have it on low or high, uh, probably four to six hours or so. We've used it in the cabin on high and it just it lasts a very, very short period of time. So that gets pretty expensive and uh, you're gonna run through those green bottles really fast. I definitely would caution against using um, a five gallon bottle inside just because when you fill propane at the temperature, so if you're filling it up at a really cold temperature and then bring it inside, that can be really, really bad because it can expand and it can actually explode the tank if it gets into much higher temperatures than what it was filled at. Uh, some other alternatives to heat, um, our plow truck driver full times in his uh, fifth wheel and he uses a 12 volt kerosene heater. I don't honestly know how much uh, how much of that if it's going to take of your battery power so I don't know how much wattage that's going to take there and um, there's kind of some various things that people use. <laughs> I mean most people are just going to be out in their escapes for a weekend and you might hit some cold weather maybe a week uh, if you like to go winter camping uh, so I think you'll do just fine at a little bit um, more moderate temps at uh, teens and above with the furnace as long as you maintain it correctly. An outdoor fire will also help keep you warm. Hope you've enjoyed the video and we've got another part two coming right up.